Welcome to Story District Presents, a podcast for people who love live storytelling. I'm Amy Sedman, your host and director of Story District. Story District has been putting on live shows, coaching and teaching the art of storytelling in Washington, D.C. since 1997. Each week on the podcast, we bring you a story from the Story District stage, and then we talk to the storyteller. But this week, we're changing it up. In this final episode of our first season, we bring you Virgins. Not one, but three stories by three comedians about first times. We'll be joined today by Vijay, Cody, and Graham. The theme of this show is virgins. Each of you had a story about your first times, all hilarious. It's taking a subject that is pretty personal, putting it out there. And I actually always appreciate that. You know, I think, I just think, I actually think it's a really kind of a generous thing to do for audiences. Any thoughts? I did this as one of my first stories. So I was in New York at the time when I, when I wrote this. And I really our first storyteller is Vijay Nathan. She is on the Story District staff as our consulting and training manager, and she's a veteran performer with several solo shows of her own. She performed this story at Story District, though this is a recording from an earlier performance in New York. First story is, so I was in New York at the time when I, when I wrote this. And I really wanted to talk about the mentality that I grew up around around sex and around what sex meant and how that related to being American, like in that sense of like sex, if you have sex, then you're becoming too American. Growing up, that was like this big thing. Like, you know, you had to be pure, you're going to get an arranged marriage. And, and so that's what I wanted to convey. When I was little, I loved riding in the car with my mom because she always let me control the radio. Whenever my dad drove, we had to listen to the news. <laughs> but when it was just me and my mom, that station wagon was my personal disco. And I became Madonna. <laughs> Lucky star, material girl, like a virgin. Now, that was my favorite. <laughs> One time, I sang the song extra loud to see if my mom knew what the words meant. <laughs> like a virgin, touched for the very first time. Like a vi- uh, uh, It was as far as I got. <laughs> One hand on the wheel, other at my throat. <laughs> she said, Vijay, you are not like a virgin. <laughs> You are a virgin. (laughs) My sisters and I weren't allowed to talk about or think about sex. According to my mom, sex is only for the Americans. (laughs) Indian girls had rules. One, no haircuts. Long hair is traditional and must be braided at all times. Loose hair means you're wild or a witch. (laughs) Two, no tampons. They're only for prostitutes. (laughs) Or white girls. Three, no boys. They're only for prostitutes. (laughs) Or white girls. My mom was the perfect Indian wife, devoted to God, husband, and home, and the best South Indian cook in all of North America. That's right, she is famous for her soft as cloud idlis, her paper thin dulces, and her tart fish curry. And every day after school, my sisters and I knew we'd find her in the kitchen cooking dinner. And this was the time that we chose to harass her about all the things that we were never supposed to talk about. We each had a role. Shanti was the instigator. I was the ingenue, and Indu was the agitator. While my mom chopped onions, Shanti would begin. Hey, mommy, tell me about your wedding night. Was it fun? (laughs) Oh, yes, mommy, it 
what did you do? What did you wear? Wear? Yes, mommy, what did you wear? I bet it was something from like, Frederick's of Hollywood. <laughs> Her chopping got faster and faster <laughs> until finally she just broke. Such dirty, dirty, dirty girls. <laughs> nothing, I wore nothing. <laughs> One day, I went into my dad's closet in search of loose change so I could buy one of those jumbo pixie sticks from the 7-Eleven. I reached down at what I thought was a penny and realized it was just a shiny piece of paper. And as I pulled away tube socks and boxers, I discovered a stack of Playboys. <laughs> How to please a man, how to please a woman, how to please yourself. <laughs> the joy of sex, the Kama Sutra, erotic secrets. Best of all, I found the official dictionary of sex. It was this nasty Webster's <laughs> with everything I needed to know from A to Z. Anal beads, buddy boots, cock rings, doggy style ejaculation, female ejaculation, <laughs> golden showers, hymen, impotent, jack off, jill off, kinky, lesbians, masturbate, nymphomaniac, orgasmic pussies, queers, rimming, sadists, transvestites, ultimate frisbee, Viennese oysters, wet spot, X spot, yoni, Zulu, princess! <laughs> full color. <laughs> now, I told no one about my secret, not even my sisters. I was very careful as to when I went into the closet. My window of opportunity was while my dad was at work and when my mom was cooking dinner. I didn't like the naked ladies so much. I thought they were kind of boring. What I liked were the pictorials with a story. You know, the nurse helping the patient into a hot tub. <laughs> The bad student getting spanked. <laughs> it just made sense. <laughs> Sometimes I felt guilty, though, because I knew that had my mom thought of it, this would have been rule number four. No porn. <laughs> it is only for prostitutes <laughs> or white girls. <laughs> but I couldn't help it. My mother would kill me if she knew, but, but somehow I had been born with this Indian girl's body and this white girl's mind. <laughs> From day one, my mom told me that I would never date, that I would get an arranged marriage, and that I would be pure and perfect on my wedding night. And I believed this until I went to college. <laughs> there, I met girls who were so carefree and liberated. They consumed men like pieces of cheese. <laughs> Being Indian was hard. I wanted to be an American. I wanted to be a fucking American. <laughs> so at 20 years old, even though I was the youngest girl in my family, I decided that I was gonna be the first to lose my virginity. But I was gonna be <laughs> smart about it. I wanted a man who would be great in bed, but never break my heart. I found the perfect specimen at my summer job waitressing at the Woodmont Country Club. Kevin Williams. 23, 6 2, Jamaican. <laughs> Sexy athletic body, IQ of a mango. <laughs> no chance of falling in love. So after weeks of making out in his car, I decided that I was ready to take the next step but I was always a prepared girl and did things right. Friday night, I went to the Safeway in the Orthodox Jewish neighborhood so I wouldn't run into anyone I knew. <laughs> there, I bought condoms, spermicide, KY jelly, and a Snickers. <laughs> I didn't want to look like a total deviant to the checkout girl. <laughs> Saturday night, I went to Kevin's house, which we had to ourselves. I was wearing all white, the sweet t-shirt and a long white skirt. 
I don't know why, but I needed to maintain some semblance of virtue in this whole process. <laughs> he led me down to the rec room, lights off, candles lit, music playing softly in the background. <laughs> And I looked around the room, wood paneled, <laughs> beige carpet, no furniture, just a blanket and a pillow. It looked like a porn set. <laughs> and suddenly I was feeling not so smart. But I made a plan and I was gonna stick to it. So I shut my eyes and we kissed and I got naked and he got naked. And suddenly, I opened my eyes, and I saw him just sort of working away. <laughs> and I realized that I could have been anyone to him, and he could have been anyone to me. And I didn't feel so liberated. Nothing had changed. I was still me. Afterwards, we shared the Snickers. <laughs> And I decided that I would wait for love or marriage before I ever did it again. Now, quality time in my family is Sunday brunch at my dad's golf club. He doesn't know how to play, but he insists. It's good for business contacts. <laughs> After the meal, he says, let's take a walk. Just me, Shanti, Indu, and Vijay. Immediately, I know something's up. Because my father never, ever, physically exerts himself. <laughs> I start to panic as we stumble past those happy golfing families onto a quiet dirt path. He motions for us to sit at a picnic table, turns to my oldest sister and says, Shanti, are you having sex? <laughs> Daddy, I'm a third year resident. I'm too tired to have sex. Good, good girl. <laughs> Indu, are you having sex? Dare. <laughs> I'm 26 years old, still living at home, <laughs> and thoroughly repulsed that you're asking me this question. <laughs> No, I'm not. <laughs> good, good girl. <laughs> Vijay, your mother has found something that leads her to believe that you are having sex. <laughs> I had gotten rid of everything. There was nothing at home that would give me away. I decided to stay calm, poker face, play the reasonable adults. Daddy, I don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> What did she find? I don't know. She won't tell me. She said if she tells me, I will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Vijay, I'm a liberal guy. <laughs> Not like your mom, you know. I know you can tell me. I know your kids, you go to college, you smoke, you drink, you... Have sex? So Vijay, tell me, are you a virgin? I didn't want to lie to my dad because I never directly lied to my parents before. Um, well, Daddy, um, I'm almost 21, not really a kid anymore, and, and I think it's just too personal to discuss. <laughs> well then, you've answered my question. And in that moment, I could see that he was no longer looking at me, but through me. And I was losing him, losing my family, losing my place. I stopped being good, being the baby, being Indian. I was becoming something different, foreign, American. And I had to make a choice. Daddy, of course I've never had sex. I'm still a virgin. I'm still good. I know it. I told your mother, she's crazy. <laughs> I told her, my daughters, they're not loose like the Chopra girls. <laughs> My 
parents, so I was like happily doing this in New York and my parents are living in Maryland, but I had a showcase, like a big show um, in in New York and I had to tell them before they came, I'm like, hey, I'm going to be talking about like some stuff that happened and, you know, just like I'm, I'm going to be talking about sex. And they'd actually heard me do stand up and they knew I had, had a boyfriend. So I guess they knew I had sex, but we didn't talk about it really. But, <laughs> but like in stand up, it's just like, you know, I might do a joke for, you know, 30 seconds and then I'm on to something else like, you know, music or whatever. So I had to prepare them for that. And I also, I talk about finding my dad's magazines and his books and, and all these things that are at our house. And so when my, when people came to the show, a lot of my friends had already seen the story. So they just watched my parents the entire time <laughs> to see how they were going to react. And afterwards, I was like, so, you know, what did you think? And my dad's like, I think that's hilarious. It's great. You're, <laughs> you know, you're so free. You know, great, great. Uh, talk about sex. And my mom was like, I don't know what golden show it is. It's a, I like gold, but I don't know what golden show it is. <laughs> so it was like I was just like it was like the right amount of you know my mom doesn't understand and my dad is on board um, a little too on board <laughs> after that <laughs> say more <laughs> oh god <sighs> and how about you Cody this is one of those stories where you don't realize it's funny until three years later because you were mortified at the time um, and that's what happened with me our next storyteller Cody is a speechwriter and story district regular he first performed this story at a show called Whiskey Dick, stories about impotence and underperformance. A week before my 19th birthday, this girl I had been seeing turned to me and said, Cody, there's something I've been meaning to ask you. I just wanted to know if there's anything that you wanted to do before turning 19. Now, 19 is not like a unique birthday. As an 18-year-old virgin, obviously, my first thought was sex, but I was like, no, there's no way she's talking about that. Get your mind out of the gutter. But then she repeated the question, is there anything you want to do before turning 19? So I started thinking, like, what haven't I done yet? I've never gone bungee jumping. I've never been to Texas. And I'm thinking of this list in my head when finally she says, Cody, is there anything you want to do like maybe me? <laughs> so that was more explicit. <laughs> but I didn't want my response to be super enthusiastic. I wanted to play it cool. But as soon as she left, I freaked the fuck out. I <laughs> opened up my Google Calendar. I made an event. And I didn't know what to call it, like, fun. I didn't know how long to make it. But this, this was a big deal. This was my second initiation into manhood after my bar mitzvah. And I wanted to be prepared, but I, I had a lot of questions, and I didn't really trust the internet that much. So I sat my sweet mate down because he was in a fraternity. I said, Phil, she wants to have sex this weekend. Do you have any tips? And he goes, oh, man, I'm so glad he came to me. So glad he came to me. First question, do you have the top bunk or the bottom bunk? Now, I couldn't think why this was relevant. So I was like, bottom bunk, why is that bad? And he goes, shit, you can't do the reverse cowgirl. And I didn't know what the reverse cowgirl was, because I had never been to Texas, but... <laughs> it was at that point that I realized that Phil was a little too advanced to be helpful to me. So I wrote to my pen pal from camp. Her name was Libby. And Libby had once talked to me about losing her virginity, so I thought, okay, it wouldn't be weird to ask her some questions. So I just berated her with questions. I was like, how many towels do I need? And more importantly, what are the performance expectations for the first time? Are we talking like 30 to 40 minutes? She goes, fuck no. Who do you think you are, like the Lance Armstrong of virgins? 30 to 40 minutes, divide by 10, then you have your answer. <laughs> Which was a problem because Google Calendar only has five minute increments, but... 
There was just one question I, I couldn't get the courage to ask Libby. I felt like I needed to ask a guy, and I had exhausted all my options. So I went to my RA. His name was Guillermo. And I went to the door, and he opened, and I said, Guillermo, I have a really urgent and personal question. And he got really serious. He was like, yeah, come on in. What's wrong? And I said, I'm having sex on Saturday. And I don't know what the expectation is when it comes to hair down there. And he looked up like he could not believe I was asking this question. And as someone who later became an RA, I can tell you this is not in the training. It's not like binge drinking and manscaping. But he was like, yeah, I'd trim a little bit. And I was like, roger that, got it. So the big night arrived, and <laughs> pro tip for those of you who haven't lost your virginity yet, don't turn the lights off. I know we're all sort of uncomfortable about our bodies and the light, but that's like going to a firing range for the first time and pointing at a target and being like, yeah, hit the lights, I got this. It's not a great idea, because as it turns out, vaginas don't glow in the dark. I was down there holding her legs like it was a Where's Waldo book, just like, it's gotta be here somewhere. And vaginas don't talk either. Otherwise, my first instinct when the lights went off would have been to go, Marco! The other thing they don't tell you about sex is that it's exhausting. After three minutes, I was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and it's not like a football game. There's, there's no one on the sidelines handing you Gatorade. <laughs> Though maybe that's what the third person does in a threesome. I, I don't know. <laughs> but the next day, I, I got a text from my RA to come to the dorm common room. And I go there, and when I walked in, all eight RAs were there. <laughs> and there was just silence. And they all start smiling. And at the same time, they all go, snip, snip, snip. <laughs> and then one of the other RAs pressed space bar on his laptop, and I just had sex by Lonely Island, started playing on the loudspeakers. So I was mortified. And that night I had dinner with that girl and there was a awkward silence and she looks up and says, so, your birthday next year? I said, we're going to Texas. <laughs> Thank you. I put like the first draft together I remember like I try in all of my stories to make myself the butt of every joke that way like you know you're not you're never punching down or you're never you know making someone else um the butt of the joke unless they deserve it but <laughs> uh I I also was hesitant because I didn't do a lot of like dirty or sex material in any previous comedy I'd done and so I wanted to make it tasteful and I thought like the way to do that is, oh, I'm not going to talk about the sex. And, you know, I never really explicitly mention um, a, a, a lot of the sex in this like first draft. You know, I have some innuendo. But I had a friend of mine that was like, you can't you can't have this whole build up, you know, where you're asking people for advice and you're waiting, you know, for the day to come where, you know, your Google calendar says you're going to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you leave people hanging. He was like, you're leaving the audience with blue balls. And it was like, <laughs> it was like you have to, he was like, you can't be afraid. You, you've, you've, you can win over the audience with some like opening endearment about how scared you are about this. But like everybody in the audience mostly has, has had sex. Like they get that this is a thing. You shouldn't be afraid. And so that's when I added, you know, the, the parts about <laughs> of the story where you know I talk about uh, the Where's Waldo joke or or stuff like that where like it's in the dark and I'm having trouble finding things <laughs> um, and I think 
that was like a point for me where I realized like, okay, I need to, you know, this is vulnerable, but if you're going to do it, don't do it halfway. Like there is a way to talk about sex in like a, in a tasteful, not cliched comedy way of like the guys going up talking about masturbating in their parents' basement. Like there is a way to do it that, that isn't crude and overdone. I don't know. I think my story, um, it just is one of these things that was so hysterical. It was so like bizarre and funny that it was like it wasn't really necessarily hard to tell. Our final storyteller, Graham Campbell, is a former cop working in law enforcement technology. He performed this story at a show called Cockblocked, stories about taking over, getting in the way, or just being a dick. And I swear, not all of our titles have the word dick. Um, I mean, at the time, it wasn't something that I was shouting from the rooftops, but I think with a lot of these things, you gain time and perspective, and then you can look back and laugh. Um, but <clears throat> I think it's also, you know, it's like so many stories I've, I've found, like, I don't remember that they're that funny until I'm just telling somebody, and they're like, that's really funny. And you're like, oh, maybe that's a story. So um, when I got to college freshman year, my roommate and I didn't have um, much in common, um, but we did have one core goal, uh, and that was to lose our virginity uh, by the end of the year. Um, now, I had no reason to believe this would happen. Um, high school was not what you would call a fertile time for me. Um, I had uh, been up the shirt once, uh, and uh, I think if you polled all the girls in my high school, they would say that Graham is the funniest, nicest friend I've ever had. <laughs> but I was at Vassar College, a former all-women's institution. It was now 60-40 women, and there were a ton of gay dudes. So, you know, we felt together that this was going to, you know, be a big thing, right? We envisioned that we would just be, like, swimming in pussy, right? That was the, the <laughs> thought that we had, right? So, um... So because of that, right, we had to develop a, a, a system, right? So what if I was giving a girl multiple orgasms, right, and my roommate <clears throat> wanted to come home and bring a girl there and also give her multiple orgasms? Again, we're already not probably probable, so why not just go all the way, right? I mean, this is <laughs> not really. So um, this is uh, 1995. Uh, it's before cell phones, so I can't text him. Uh, so, but we did have a piece of technology that may have, may, maybe you may know, it's uh, called the whiteboard, right? Um, and so, like, so we're gonna have to write something on the board as a code word, right? He's like, okay. And he's like, I got it. I'm like, okay. He's like, tippy toe. And I'm like, okay. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, right? You, you can't write tippy toe. They're gonna know in a heartbeat, like, what you're doing and it's gonna blow up the whole thing, right? So I'm like, do you know a Lou? He's like, no, I don't know a Lou. I'm like, I don't know a Lou. We're going to write Lou called on the board, right? So if you see Lou called, that means that we're in there doing what we're supposed to be doing, right? And uh, he's like, okay, got it. No problem, right? So um, months go by. Apparently, I didn't need any goggles. There wasn't as much swimming as I thought. Um, <laughs> but it, it did turn out that being a nice guy was actually pretty good in college, right? There was flirting a little bit and some joking and the tickle game. And... Uh, so, so, um, so there was one nice young girl named Sarah, um, and uh, she was in my Introduction to American Politics class, and we were getting along fine, a little flirting a bit, and uh, so on one Friday, I was like, hey, um, do you want to, after, you know, I know you have class after this, and I don't, do you want to come back to my room afterwards, right? And the room, coming back to the room is a big step in, in the sexuality of college, um, and I was like, I have a great view, which I did. I legit had a great view of the quad. So it was like, I wasn't, you know, this is real. I wouldn't lie to her. Um, <laughs> so she said, like, okay. And I was like, all right, right? So, um, <laughs> so she went to class, um, and I went to, back to my room to begin um, what I call the process, right? So I had a three-step process. Um, when a girl came to my room that I did for m shamefully many years in college. Um, uh, first step um, was to put on the Braveheart soundtrack. Uh, uh, right. Second step was to turn the halogen lamp, which were legal back then, uh, turn the halogen lamp to setting two, which is like the makeout session, right? It was real dark. Um, and step three, for reasons that I still don't understand, I would put on mesh shorts. Um, 
I know. I thought it was sort of like a, I'm casual, but I'm also excited to see you. I don't know what I was, it was. So, and as part of this new plan we had, I wrote Lou called on the whiteboard. And I didn't just write Lou called. I was like, Lou called, call Lou back. Lou called again, it's serious. I think Lou is dying. I mean, the whole whiteboard was covered in Lou called, right? And I waited, right? And the knock came at the door and I opened the door and she was there looking lovely as always. And, uh, I was there with strains of bagpipes coming over my head, and I'm sure a raging erection, and I was like, oh, hey, wanna, uh, wanna come in? And like many Vassar women who are faced with their predicament, you sort of could see the whole like, <sighs> fine, right? Like she knew, it was like, uh, this is, all right. So, she came in. And so, now we're getting it on, right? We're hooking up, right? The mesh shorts are off, and the top is off, right? And I'm rounding all kinds of bases, and the drums, and the beating, and the bagpipes, it's all happening, right? And I'm like, I'm touching, I'm trying to please her in ways that I don't even, I'm just doing things. Like, Sarah McLachlan had an album called Fumbling Towards Ecstasy, uh, which is exactly like what I was doing. Also, pro tip, um, Fumbling Towards Ecstasy, way better album than the Braveheart soundtrack, if you want to hook up. That's, you can take that one, that's yours. So, um, so, right, so we're, we're getting, now, we're, now we've moved on past the petting, and now I think it's gonna happen, right? This is it, I'm, I'm going to the mountaintop. We're, we're locked in, right? And, uh, and then as I'm ready to do whatever, uh, I hear the elevator. And the second I, it was an older building, and the second I heard the elevator, I'm like, oh, it's him. It's, I know it's him. In the core of my body, I knew it was him. So I'm still stay on target, stay on target, right? I'm like doo 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 doo, right? Like you know, tune all the buttons and hands, and right, things are happening, right? On a twin bed, mind you, by the way, this is like fucking Twister, and it was like a whole right, this things, and I can hear it, and the elevator stops, and I hear him walk down the hall. I know it's him, and then I hear, oh, Lou called, and the door just swings fucking open, right? <laughs> and she screams, uh, and I'm just staring at him, like butt ass naked, like. And he's like, oh, and he closed the door, right? And he's like, sorry. And I like lost, I was like, what, what do we say? What, what do we say? What was the code word? What was the code word? Lou called, we're like yelling at the door. And, and what's written on that door? Look at the door, what's written on the door? He's like, Lou, Lou called a lot. I'm like, so, so uh, what, 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 what's going on? He's like, bro. <laughs> I met a guy named Lou at the library today. And I'm like, what? What are the chances that in the day that I'm to lose my virginity, you meet a guy named Lou at the goddamn library? Like, how could that, how does that happen? I've totally forgotten there's like a naked woman, right? I'm just like lost it, right? And he's like, and he's like, oh, you know, it's funny, because uh, I didn't give him my number. I'm like, you want you to give the number? How the fuck would he call? He couldn't call. You know? Why would he call so many times? And, and in this moment, I noticed that Sarah was uh, dressed and at the door. Because women, when they're angry, can dress dressed real fast, right? So she was dressed at the door, and the door opens, and he's still standing there. I'm covering myself with my mesh shorts. Um, and she just turns and says, I, I never want to talk to you ever again. And I was like, that's fair. I told, you, you got it. My, my condolences. Um, and the door closes, right? And I go back to screaming. I'm like, you've taken the only thing I ever wanted my entire life from me. Like I was this, this close to victory and it's all over. I'll never have sex ever again. Right? And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And so we ended up uh, laughing because it's the only thing you can do when you're screaming at each other through a door. Right? Um, so that was fine. So we um, went back to tippy toe uh, because uh, <laughs> we're clearly not able to handle any kind of simple basic code words. Um, and I, some of you might be concerned, I did lose my virginity. Um, yep, yep, thank you, thank you, thank you. It was uh, December 13th, 1995. Um, my birthday, uh, and in keeping with your birthday, I did not get her a present. I think that's fair to say. It was, uh, it was, I was very sorry, it was not. But it was quick, so. Uh, like, yeah, who's been great their first time? Come the fuck on, right? I, all right, so anyway, so. So I was, got that out of the way, right? And, uh, and so then later in the spring, now I'm coming home, back to my dorm room, and I walk up to the door, and I see tippy-toe written in big letters in the door. 
I stood up and I was like, Tippy Toe? I just met a guy named Tippy Toe at the library today. <laughs> That's my time, everybody. Yes, I know. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. So it was, it was really fun. How did he not know? I mean, it's crazy that he didn't know. I know. He's just real slow, and he, you know, he literally <laughs> didn't meet that guy. He met Lou at the library, and he swore that that. Was, I mean, he just was not thinking at all. And yeah, he's just real and slow. And why did you wear mesh shorts? I've been wanting to ask. <clears throat> um, I, <laughs> why did you own Wait, a mesh why shorts? Why did you have a I'm about to have sex uniform? You well, were like, so, this is my go-to. So yeah, so the uniform. Um, it was really more of a hopeful uniform. You know, it wasn't like, and also I think because, again, this is, you know, over air, so you can't see how athletic I am, which I'm not. Um, I think it was more like mesh shorts conveyed a sense of athleticism uh, that I was going for. And I really maybe thought that when I opened the door, like, that was the chance to, like, seal it. Like, that they were like, I gotta, okay, no. You know, like, they just, like, wave goodbye and walk away. Um, yeah, the mesh, it was... It became obvious all... It was just a very dumb idea, right? So it was just raging. Also, why was Braveheart your soundtrack? Well, I loved the Braveheart movie. Uh, and uh, and I thought that it was... It was, like... It was really... Triumphant? It was so dumb because this is a time in, like, the mid-90s when, like, Sarah McLaughlin and Tori Amos um, and everyone was, like, really... Ani DeFranco was, like, huge. And these were really sexy songs by sexy women who were singing them. Um, and I was like, nope, 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 not going that way. Check this out. Like... <laughs> track 17 like Ophelia's Kiss this is the one with all the drums right it was like you know whatever it was it was like it, it, and you'd sit there with the Iowa like CD player and like fast forward fast forward fast forward you know you right. want to get to the good part right because right. the first first song's like credits you have to get to the good like the battle scene um, <laughs> which really was really dumb because then, you, then you're like you want to do something and the drums like everything's going crazy it's like you really should have timed it better so that was when you were actually having the sex but really it was always like so uh uh, how's it going at school? It's like, <laughs> blah, 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 right? It's like, yeah, it was. Uh, it's amazing. I got laid at all. It's really, it's really. Uh, that's hilarious. Graham, how did you end up? When did you do your first story? Why did you tell your first story? I'd um, wanted to do a story for a while. I'd actually been pitching a story for about a year, and it just it did it wasn't it wasn't even like I got rejected. It was that the timing didn't work out. So I was slotted for a certain theme, and then that theme, um, yeah, I couldn't make it. And then you know I had in my head it was like, well, this is one story, so I got to wait until the theme comes back. And then uh, it turns out I didn't even use that story, but uh, <laughs> but um, and but it also came from a you know doing stand up. Um, or trying stand up before and sort of finding it, looking for a different medium that gave more time, I think, than, uh, than stand up did. So, how about you, Vijay? No, I think it was like 2000, 2001. So, I started doing stand up in 97. And, um, and I had started out in Maryland and then I ended up moving to New York and I was just, you know, uh, I was doing stand up, but I, f I got kind of at a point where I couldn't get any further, like at New York comedy clubs. And so someone told me about this, this class that was really, that it was not about storytelling. It was um, solo performance, which that's what it was called in New York back in the day. <laughs> and so, um, so I didn't know I was uh, telling stories until I actually came back to the DC area in 2007. And people were like, oh, that's storytelling. So I was just uh, trying to take some things that were that more centered around my comedy or themes that were in my comedy and to expand them because in stand up it's like you have and especially in New York you've got I would say like you have to be funny within the first like 20 seconds and for me it's also much more of an aggressive art form at the time maybe if I get better at it I'll feel like less of a like that I have to put on the suit of armor when I'm doing stand-up, but it feels more aggressive. And then storytelling felt like I could cover the whole uh, range of emotions, and I had that, and just the the rhythm of it allowed for that. How about you, Cody? Uh, so I started doing stand-up in sixth grade. I, I made a bully laugh, and... He stopped bothering me, and <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He kept bothering me, but but like in that moment, I was like, "Wow, this is power." I kept doing it, and I, I didn't start uh, like 
doing storytelling as a performance on stage like stand up until my senior year of college a uh, group of students started something like story district they called it telltale um and I, I told this virginity story for the first time there as a senior um and when i moved to dc same thing i you know i i started to do stand up at bars and then i shifted over to storytelling mainly because stand up's miserable in the <laughs> city i mean it's in you're in the basement of a bar in like dupont or, or somewhere and you know there are 40 people and you get there, and if you're the rookie, they just treat you terribly. They're like, you're 15th, and you have to bring 10 people for the next 80 shows. Yeah. Yeah. And the 14 people in front of you are mostly guys who get up and talk about masturbating in their parents' basement. <laughs> and by the time you get up at 15th, it's like 11 o'clock, and the crowd is down to 20 people who are drunk, and they heckle you, and you get three and a half or four minutes. And if you're not funny... She's right. If you're not funny, the first twenty seconds, like they're pissed at you because they're drunk and they want to laugh. And your masturbation stories seem real tired and old by that point. Yeah, yeah. Every there are only <laughs> so many variations of that joke, but um, but yeah. And so when you know when I when I did my first story district show, I was like, wow, what an experience! Because not only is the audience paid to be there, they want to be there, they're having a good time, and and they're generous with their laughs and with their support, but. You know, you get to it gets to be more of an event where where you, you know, interact with the audience in a way that that doesn't happen in stand up. And also the performers are a lot nicer. Yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to say was that what's so nice about particularly a story district show is that you're not competing with each other. Whereas like in, in some other storytelling shows you are or even in stand up where it's like, I got to be funnier than the last guy. I gotta, you know, there's that feeling of like one upsmanship. And so at Story District, what's so nice is that each person is just them being the best version of themselves, which is just like that's why I feel like it's nice to be around that. We also encourage new people. So being the rookie is, isn't like a demerit or doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to be respected. Right. Well, I think, I think that's almost better, better for it. Right. Because like a lot of the stories you'll hear are people who would never normally do this. And that's that those stories are great. Um, and they would probably never get up to do stand up because it's a terrible world. Uh, but like, you know, you never, right. It's like, I don't think you'd ever like be like, Oh, I'll just go down to, you know, I got three kids and I'll go down to this basement, you know, like Cody says. And uh, it, the story district is like, no, it's this collaborative thing. Come and we'll give you a rehearsal. And I think you get a lot better performances, out of it than you would, you know, elsewhere. Well, let me just stand up for the stand-ups. You two are weak. True. <laughs> no, but... True. I completely agree no, with yeah, you. No, yeah, absolutely. Have, I mean, without a doubt. Are you looking at me right yeah, now? No, I am weak. Yeah. He, he is. You, it's, but, it's sound, but you, I can tell you he's weak. Yeah, no. <laughs> but I get what you're saying. Like, when I started, there was no storytelling. But, uh, like, uh, the other thing I will say is that the best stand-ups are really good storytellers. So, yeah. like, Mike Birbiglia, I think that Chris Rock, um, Kevin Hart, those guys are all storytellers that have a lot of punchlines. I, I do think that, you know, Mike Birbiglia is someone who I, like, try and copy. And, I'm, he, you know, he's one of my favorites. And I, he gave one interview where he said, you know, he does these long-form one-man shows where he's weaving in, like, 20 stories together with all these different callbacks that, you know, takes, like must take, you know, months to write and 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 perfect. And he said, I think your typical stand up offers you chicken wings. It's joke joke joke. And my goal is to offer you a three course meal. And like that was you know, felt like a good way of describing it to me where like not only with storytelling do you get more emotions, but you you know, you take away you know, a Take away the full body of emotions in a story and you get to build characters and the audience gets to care about the characters and follow them through an event where as someone like Dimitri Martin, Stephen Wright, Mitch Hedberg, all of whom I love are one-liner comedians where it's just joke, 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 joke. There needs to be a laugh every 10 seconds. So are any of you doing stand-up comedy now? I mean, I've been do- doing stand-up since 97, so uh, I am known to more people as a stand-up comedian than as a storyteller. But once I started putting together show, like my first show that I put together was called Good Girls Don't, But Indian Girls Do, which the story that we're playing, or that you played, is from. And um, that was actually when I got more of an when I got an audience 
even though it went and it was basically there was a lot of comedy in it, but it wasn't stand up. So, um, wait, what was that? I don't know if I have. Oh, I wanted to know just if you're still doing stand up. You know, some people find storytelling, or some comedians, I'll say, they find storytelling like, oh, I'm going to do storytelling going forward. And some do both. So just well, curious. Well, I like doing both. And there's definitely, there are lots of things that when I write a story and I have uh, jokes in them that I actually then take out and do in my stand-up. Um, and also, wait, I totally forgot what I was going to say. I know, I'm so glad <laughs> Are you there. I? No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I'm trying to answer all the questions. Um, oh, oh, no, no, no. Okay, so, so. Yeah, but okay, this is why like I go back to doing stand-up sometimes because sometimes something just happens and it, there's not going to be a whole story around it, but it's something that I want to talk about. And that's and I do love that I can just like get up on stage and just kind of spit it out and see what happens. Yeah, without being like, why does this matter? Is there an arc? Yeah, like yeah. and and yeah, cuz not everything is connected, but sometimes when you have enough of those little things, then you see that there actually is an arc eventually and you can turn that into a story, it can become a story. So, um so I really yeah, I I still love doing stand up and it's a very different relationship to the audience as well because you can constantly break um, you know, I mean, in, in storytelling, if you're really comfortable enough, then you can kind of riff with the audience. But for the most part, a lot of people, most people don't. Um, but I like having that ability to improvise with the audience and for it to be new for me. Everything becomes new when you get to do stand up, which is fun. Yeah. And you, Cody, you said you still do stand up. I still do stand up. I, I think the reason I started to just continue with storytelling and do less of stand up is think I was better at it. Um, I, I still, ha I mean, I did stand up all throughout college and, and high school and middle school. And I, I would do like these five minute sets where I would, you know, do joke, joke, joke. And it wasn't that, I don't think I was terrible, but you know, it's, I mean, it's hard. It's coming up with, you know, with stories. Um, one of the things I love about it that, you know, Birbigli and these other comics do, is they do callbacks and that's my favorite part. Of, You're good at that. Yeah. Of because they reward the audience for listening. You're you're creating, you know, there there's a callback in the virginity story I have where it, I I say, you know, Phil says to me, um, oh, you can't do the reverse cowgirl in in the bottom bunk and I didn't know what that was cuz I'd never been to Texas. And it calls back to this this joke earlier and I love stuff like that cuz you're essentially creating an inside joke uh, with a room of 200 to 1000 people depending on how big it is. You know, which and which you can only do really in a set that is going to be longer than three minutes. Yeah, that's a good point. Special thanks to Vijay, Graham, and Cody for joining us in the studio today. That's it for our season one finale. But the season is not over yet. Keep listening because we have three bonus episodes with more stories from storytellers you met this season. Stay tuned for Chris's infamous dildo story, Andrea's coming out story, and Kara's horrible breakup. We are hard at work getting ready for season two. If you're enjoying this podcast, please share it with your friends, shout it from the rooftops, and rate it on iTunes. It helps us a lot. Visit storydistrict.org to find pictures and links related to this episode. And while you're there, get tickets to our live shows, pitch a story of your own, sign up for a class, or hire our fantastic consulting team to work with your business or organization. This show is made possible in part with funding from the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Our show is produced by Lizzie Peabody, Ronald Young Jr., Alana Nevins, Nick Hill, Tim St. Clair, and Jackson Bierfeld. I'm Amy Sedman, and this is Story District Presents. I don't want to miss you guys, but we'll be back soon. See you next season.